Okay, so thanks everyone for coming. We're going to talk about early pregnancy complications and um, I apologise if it's too basic and I also apologise if, uh, if it's more detailed than what we need, but, uh, but we'll see how we go, okay? So um, we are going to talk about uh, these things, these complications in early pregnancy. Um, we'll talk about bleeding issues and how to investigate and manage them. We'll talk about pain in early pregnancy. Uh, we'll have a talk about miscarriage and, uh, and we'll talk about ectopic pregnancy. We'll also have a brief talk about febrile illnesses in early pregnancy. Um, we'll have a talk about the use of aspirin in early pregnancy because it's always worthwhile just continuing to sort of just discuss that and the importance of, uh, of women who require the commencement of aspirin in early pregnancy because that's something that's great when GPs can initiate. And then we'll have a bit of a talk about COVID uh, in early pregnancy um, because that's obviously topical and uh, there will no doubt be some questions about that. So um, the first thing to say is that vaginal bleeding is obviously very common. Um, it's, uh, we estimate about 20, between 20 and 40% of women will have vaginal bleeding early in pregnancy. And of those uh, 20 to 40% of women that have bleeding, about 10 to 20% of those will go on and miscarry. So the majority won't. Um, about one to 2% of those women that are bleeding will have an end up having an ectopic pregnancy. Of the women that have uh, vaginal bleeding who then go on and have an ongoing viable pregnancy, they're not completely out of the woods. Those women do have an increased risk of mid-trimester loss, an increased risk of preterm birth, and an increased risk of fetal growth restriction uh, above baseline. And those risks are probably mainly for women that have an ongoing subchorionic hematoma that is ongoing on ultrasound into the second trimester. And what we think happens for some of these women is that if they have an ongoing subchorionic hematoma, uh, then ongoing small micro bleeds uh, increase the risk of uterine activity and ruptured membranes and preterm labor later on. Now, obviously the majority of women don't have that complication, but there certainly is an increased risk of that, especially if they have an ongoing small subchorionic hematoma into the second trimester. The concept behind an increased risk of growth restriction is probably due to problems with placentation. So the baby's placenta develops around the, or fully implants around the 10 to 12 week mark. So if there's any bleeding under the trophoblast that goes to form the placenta, we think that for some women that will increase risk of growth restriction later in the pregnancy. It's also worth pointing out, of course, that uh, vaginal bleeding in early pregnancy creates a large degree of anxiety for women. Um, for a lot of women who are bleeding in early pregnancy, it comes as, as quite a surprise. Uh, a lot of women don't anticipate complications in pregnancy. And for a lot of young women, uh, when they have bleeding in early pregnancy, this may be one of their first uh, contacts with, uh, with a hospital health service. So worth mentioning that for a lot of women, this is a, a time of, of great anxiety. What causes bleeding? Well, of course, we must worry about miscarriage. We must worry about ectopic pregnancies. But it's worth also mentioning some other causes of bleeding. Uh, every now and again, we'll see a cervical polyp or a vaginal polyp, which may cause bleeding. Every now and again, we'll see a cervical ectropion. Um, and of course, rarely we may see a cancer. Obviously, fairly uncommon amongst young women. The cervical ectropion is an erosion on the cervix uh, where you get the, fle the fleshy glandular epithelium uh, sort of goes onto the ex external cervix. And... Um, for some women who are busy running around or exercising, you can get some contact bleeding or some surface bleeding, which may present as vaginal bleeding. So that's a not uncommon cause of scanty vaginal bleeding early or at any stage in pregnancy, really. How do we investigate and diagnose uh, vaginal bleeding in early pregnancy? Well, it's, it's, uh, I'm sure we all know it's a combination of uh, transvaginal ultrasound um, and uh, beta HCG levels. Uh, transvaginal ultrasound is, is the mainstay, of course, and especially for women that are over six weeks gestation, um, transvaginal ultrasound is the mainstay of diagnosis. About 70 to 90 percent of women will have their problems sorted out with uh, the use of transvaginal ultrasound, and only between 10 and 30 percent will, uh, you know, have an uncertain diagnosis uh, from transvaginal ultrasound, and will need to go on and have uh, beta HCG levels and uh, serial HCG levels, and that's most common early in pregnancy. Uh, prior to six or seven weeks. Serum progesterone is a little bit controversial. Uh, there are some advocates of it, but it probably has a limited role in an acute setting. We'll talk a little bit more about uh, the use of serum progesterone levels in a little bit. So I thought I'd just go through what babies look like on ultrasound in the first trimester, just so that we uh, have a bit of an understanding as to what we expect to see on ultrasound. 
Um, between about four and a half and five weeks of amenorrhea, we start to see a small gestational sac. So you can see there the small black uh, dot within the endometrial cavity. And if you use your imagination, you can just see a white rim around the gestational sac, which is called the decidual reaction. So the gestational sac is only between two and five millimeters at this point. Um, but the presence of an injury in my gestational sac at this time is reassuring that the baby is in the right place and reduces the risk significantly of it being an ectopic pregnancy. Uh, from between five and the start of the sixth week, we start to see the yolk sac, and um, we really should be seeing the yolk sac if the gestational sac is over about 12 millimeters in size. If the yolk, gestational sac is more than 12 millimeters in size and there's no yolk sac, then it starts to raise the prospect of a non ongoing or non viable pregnancy. Getting to the sixth week, we start to see the fetal pole, and um, at the start of the, the end of the fifth and the start of the sixth week, the fetal pole is often about two to four millimeters, and that's often when we start to see the onset of fetal heart motion. Almost always, fetal heart motion is seen by the time the uh, fetal pole is six millimeters in size, and uh, we'll talk about it in a moment. The current guidelines suggest that you know you should definitely see it after seven millimeters, and, and it's almost certainly diagnostic of a miscarriage if the fetal heart is not seen when the crown lump length is seven millimeters. At this stage, the yolk sac is often attached to the uh, fetal pole, so that's a normal appearance. Uh, the little yolk sac just adjacent to the fetal pole is a normal appearance at about six weeks. Getting on further into the sixth week, uh, the baby starts to look a bit like a kidney bean. And uh, as I mentioned before, fetal heart motion should definitely be apparent now when the baby is greater than six or seven millimeters in size. We should also start to see a, a good heart rate at this stage, and we like to see it above 120 beats per minute. If it's below 120 beats per minute, it raises the prospect of a pregnancy that's not uh, going to be a goer. And if it's under 85 beats per minute, then it's almost certainly suggestive of a failing pregnancy. By about seven weeks, we're starting to see which end is which of the baby, uh, the head and the body end, and we're starting to see the baby measuring between 11 and 16 millimetres in, uh, in size, and the yolk sac is still present. By about eight weeks, we're starting to see a bit more. We're starting to see the skull and the fore and the hind brain develop. We're starting to see little limb buds developing, and the fetus is measuring anywhere between 17 and 24 to 25 millimetres, and the yolk sac remains present. You can see that there just behind the baby. By about nine to 10 weeks, we've got much more definition. We've got limbs budding and they're starting to develop some definition and, um, and the baby measures anywhere between 24 and 35 millimeters in length. And um, we, the fetal heart rate reaches its maximum rate at about this time and it usually reaches about 170 to 180 beats per minute. A couple of ultrasound appearances of things that are not going well. This is an early embryonic demise. So what we've got here is an empty gestational sac, which is starting to look a little bit irregular. Um, and we've basically got nothing in it. So this is a early embryonic demise. We've got a gestational sac here where the fetus has failed to, uh, to develop within it. Uh, most of the time we would expect to see a fetus within the gestational sac if it's more than 20 millimeters. And in uh, days gone by, 20 millimeter, 20 millimeter gestational sac was the diagnostic threshold for when we would expect to see a small fetus. Uh, we've now moved that back to 25 millimeters. Uh, so when the, max, when the mean uh, uh, diameter of the sac is over 25 millimeters, we would certainly expect to see a fetus within us if the pregnancy is viable and ongoing. This is an anembryonic fetus, or oh, embryo. So this is, a, um, this is a gestational sac, which you can see is starting to become irregular, where you've got a yolk sac, but you haven't got an embryo within it. And this is another fetal demise. So what are our, oh, and the last slide, sorry, is, uh, is what we can see with an incomplete miscarriage and uh, evidence of retained products of conception. So if a woman's having uh, a miscarriage, um, all this retained products, then what we tend to see is this heterogeneous material inside the uterus. Uh, and if it measures over about 12 to 15 millimeters in, in size, then that suggests retained products or material still within the uterus. So you can see on this ultrasound, there's no gestational sac. We've got some mechagenic debris. And when it measures more than about 12 to 15 millimeters in, in size, that suggests retained products of conception. So what are the diagnostic criteria or how do we diagnose a miscarriage on ultrasound? Well, there are two different ways of diagnosing an ultrasound. There's, I guess, what we call the single ultrasound diagnosis, where you can you do a single ultrasound and you can get diagnostic criteria. So 
as I mentioned before, if you do an ultrasound uh, and the crown lump length is more than seven millimeters and there's no fetal heart rate, then that is diagnostic of a, of a, a non-viable pregnancy. Now, seven millimeters is very, very conservative. We were using six millimeters up until five or six years ago. And the reality is for most fetuses, you really should see a heart rate from four to five millimeters onwards. And if you don't erase the prospect of a non-viable pregnancy, so seven millimeters is very conservative and, and, and generally diagnostic of a miscarriage if uh, there's no fetal heart uh, present at, uh, at that gestational size. The other certain diagnostic criteria of an ultrasound is the presence of a gestational sac greater than 25 millimeters and no embryo or yolk sac within it. Okay, so once again, it's a very conservative measurement. Uh, we were using 20 millimeters until a few years ago. Um, really from 15 to 20 millimeters onwards, you should be seeing an embryo or a, or a yolk sac within it. But 25 millimeters is, is the, the certain diagnostic criteria. This is virtually 100% sensitive and specific. And as I mentioned, they're very conservative uh, levels where nothing really gets missed. So they're the single ultrasound diagnostic criteria, if you like. But as I mentioned before, if the crown lump is anything from four to five millimeters onwards, there's no fetal heart rate. It certainly raises the strong prospect of a non-viable pregnancy, but it needs to be, it's only really diagnostic if it's over seven millimeters. So that's the single ultrasound diagnosis, if that makes sense. Um, and then the other way we have of diagnosing the miscarriage is on serial ultrasound. So if the uh, embryo is, is too small to make the certain ultrasound diagnosis, then it's progress ultrasounds which make the diagnosis. So if you can see a gestational sac on ultrasound um, and uh, another ultrasound performed in two weeks shows no progress to uh, an embryo within the gestational sac, then that's diagnostic of a non-progressing pregnancy. So that picture I showed you before of the empty gestational sac, um, if that's under 25 millimeters, then it's possible the baby just hasn't, is not visible. But during another ultrasound in two weeks, if there's still no progress to an embryo, then that's diagnostic of a non-viable pregnancy. If a gestational sac is seen and there's a yolk sac but no embryo, then one really should see an embryo with a heart rate within about 11 days. So another ultrasound in 10 or 11 days. And if the gestational sac and the yolk sac has not progressed to an embryo, then that is diagnostic of uh, a miscarriage. The other way, of course, is that if one sees an embryo with a heartbeat and then a serial ultrasound shows the loss of a, of a heart rate, then of course that's diagnostic as well. We'll talk a little bit about beta HCGs now and, and how to interpret the levels of HCG. Um, uh, HCG assays were, were really developed in the 1960s, first in urine and then first uh, in serum in 1966. Prior to that, it was injecting uh, female urine into, into either mice or male frogs to see if they either ovulated or made sperm to work out whether there was HCG in the urine. That's obviously fairly limited in clinical utility. So the, uh, the arrival of urine in serum assays is, uh, has made life a lot easier. Um, the HCG molecule consists of an alpha and a beta subunit and the alpha subunit of the beta HCG of the HCG molecule is the same as the LH, FSH and TSH alpha subunit. Uh, which is why uh, high HCG levels in early pregnancy can give some women a suppressed TSH and some women a mild hyperthyroidism. HCG is first detectable in serum from six to eight days post conception at lower levels of five to 10 international units per litre. And it's detectable in urine from nine days post conception. So that's um, day 23 of a 28 day cycle, presuming ovulation is day four, ovulation and conception is day 14. So detectable in urine, several days before uh, the missed period and, uh, and a little bit before that in serum. So the utility of serial HCG levels is really uh, of most use when the HCG is less than 1500 because 1500 international units per, per litre is thought to be the diagnostic threshold for when we should see a baby on ultrasound. So, you know, the, the main utility of performing serial ultrasounds is for those really early pregnancies, uh, serial HCGs rather, is for those really early pregnancies when the HCG is less than 1500. And we'll talk about that in a bit of a diagnostic algorithm, algorithm in a sec. So how does HCG normally behave? Well, HCG uh, up until eight weeks gestation the mean doubling time is 48 hours. So the average doubling time for HCG is roughly a doubling in 48 hours. Um, but having said that, um, a lot of viable gestations, the HCG will rise less than that. So in 85% in of the time, in a normal viable pregnancy, the HCG should rise by 
about with 80, about with 66 percent in 48 hours. Okay, but that leaves us with about 15 percent of normal pregnancies with where it rises at less than 66 percent in 48 hours. Um, but really, 99 percent of viable pregnancies it should rise over about 50 or 53 percent in 48 hours. But the first centile is actually way down at 33 percent. Okay, so you know there are a small number of viable gestations where it rises slowly, but really under 33% rise is, is virtually 100% uh, non-viable. And if it's rising at less than 53% in 48 hours, then we're really dealing with the vast majority of, of uh, pregnancies being non-viable. After about eight weeks, the rise is less, and one needs to be a little bit cautious about HCG rises after eight weeks because it does rise a bit slower. And it, it, normal pregnancies it can rise a bit slower. And as we get to 10 weeks, it, it can, for some women, it can really start to plateau, and it can in fact start to decline even after 10 or 11 weeks. So it's important when doing um, HCG levels to be mindful that HCG does really plateau at 10 to 11 weeks, and it can, for some women, it can decline. So every now and again, we'll see a, a woman who has a couple of HCGs done around the 10 weeks gestation, and, um, and a lot of anxiety is created when those levels don't seem to rise or even come down a little bit, um, but the, the baby is, is viable, and that can be a normal pattern of HCG at that gestation. This next chart is not particularly good, but it does show you the rapid rise up until eight to nine weeks, and then it shows you that decline in that plateau around the 10, 11 week mark. Okay, and it also shows you the large variation between normal HCG levels um, uh, for viable babies. Okay, but just reinforcing that the fact that HCG levels um, really do plateau at 10 to 11 weeks. So there's really no utility in doing HCG levels at that point. We're really diagnosing problems in pregnancy by ultrasound. Okay, at that point. So what are abnormal HCG rises? Well, the HCG rises much more slowly in failing and ectopic pregnancies. And as I mentioned before, a strong indicator of a non-viable pregnancy is a rise of less than 50% over the 48 hour period. Okay, and that's up to eight weeks gestation. And it's you know, roughly 99% predictive of a non-viable pregnancy if the HCG rise is less than 50% in 48 hours. About 80% of ectopic pregnancies will, will have an HCG rise of less than 50% over 48 hours, but about 20% of ectopics, the HCG rise is in fact greater than 50% and they can appear to behave like a normal pregnancy. So just uh, being mindful that 20% that, you know, of ectopics will actually have a, a, a rapidly raising HCG, but certainly the majority of them will have an HCG, uh, which is rising at less than 50% over 48 hours. Another important point to make about HCG levels is there is a 10 to 15% interassay variability. Um, so be mindful about performing serial HCGs at the same lab and with the same assay, um, because comparing HCG levels between labs and between assays is subject to some inter into assay variability of up to 10 to 15%. So just when comparing rises and declines and things, just be mindful about HCG levels which are performed at differing labs and with differing assays within labs. So I guess what sort of diagnoses can we make on HCG levels alone? Well, as I mentioned, an HCG rising less than 50% in 48 hours is, is virtually diagnostic of a non-viable pregnancy, pregnancy. Now, it doesn't tell us whether it's a non-viable intrauterine pregnancy or an ectopic pregnancy, but an HCG rise of less than 50% in 48 hours up to which gestation is virtually diagnostic of a pregnancy that's not going to be a viable intrauterine pregnancy. An HCG falling over 48 hours is, is virtually diagnostic of a failing pregnancy and a rapid decline is, you know, is su highly suggestive of a rapidly resolving uh, either ectopic or intrauterine pregnancy. Pretty much all other trends with HCG require monitoring of levels and an eventual transvaginal ultrasound. I mentioned before that progesterone has fairly limited utility. Um, there are some guidelines and some advocates of it. Generally, a progesterone level above 25 nanomoles per litre does suggest a viable pregnancy. Um, however, normal pregnancies have been reported uh, down to a level of 15.9 nanomoles per litre. And, um, and some abnormal pregnancies will have HCG, uh, will have, that should be progesterone rather than HCG, but about one to 2% of abnormal pregnancies will have a progesterone greater than 25. So, you know, over 25 is reassuring, but there will be a few abnormal pregnancies that will have a, a progesterone above 25. 
and some normal pregnancies uh, have been reported down to a level of 15. Having said that, if it's under 10 nanomoles per litre, then it's not, there's a 98% specificity for a non-viable pregnancy. And if it's very, very low indeed, less than five nanomoles per litre, we're dealing with a very, very small likelihood of a viable pregnancy. If the progesterone, every now and again, we'll see a progesterone level that is high and we suspect a viable pregnancy, but if that turns out to be an ectopic pregnancy, um, these ectopic pregnancies tend to be ones that are, are alive in the fallopian tube with a heartbeat and a, a yolk sac and, um, you know, are, are growing, are growing vigorously. Okay, so um, the couple of percent of abnormal pregnancies with an HCG above 25 are often, you know, viable or growing pregnancies with heartbeats and things in the, uh, in the fallopian tube or elsewhere. One of the downsides of using progesterone in the acute situation is the turnaround time. Most labs, it takes a day or two and it's hard to get the same day result with the progesterone. So it has a limited utility in an acute setting, but there are some roles to play where there's some clinical doubt with low HCG levels. So, um, so some algorithms do incorporate its use. I guess marrying up ultrasound and HCG levels, there's this thing called a discriminatory level of HCG where we should see an ult a, 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 a fetus on ultrasound. Um, for transabdominal ultrasounds, most guidelines and most studies would suggest that if the HCG is above 2,000 international units per litre, we should see a intrauterine pregnancy on ultrasound. For most good quality transvaginal ultrasounds, that can be lowered down to between 1,000 and 2,000 international units per litre. And most guidelines would use a cutoff of about 1,500 uh, international units per litre to see a um, intrauterine gestation on ultrasound. Okay, so um, an HCG uh, over 1,500, if the pregnancy is viable and ongoing, one would expect to see a gestational sac and a fetus within the uterus, okay? If the HCG is over 1500 and we don't see a fetus inside the uterus, then we presume it's an ectopic pregnancy um, until proven otherwise. And in fact, if it is an ectopic pregnancy and the HCG is at 1500, then most of the time at this level of HCG, we will actually see an adnexal mass or evidence of an ectopic pregnancy somewhere else, okay? Uh, not always, but most of the time we will see it in the order of 80 to 90 percent of the time. Uh, if the HCG is over 1500 and is an ectopic, we'll of course see an empty uterus and we will often actually see the ectopic pregnancy. So the HCG of 1500, uh, you know, poses some diagnostic difficulties. Um, you know, it, it, it raises the prospects of, you know, an early pregnancy, an ectopic pregnancy, or a family pregnancy, and monitoring is required. So if the HCG is less than 1500 and we cannot see a pregnancy inside the uterus and we cannot see evidence of an ectopic pregnancy, then by definition at this stage, this is a pregnancy of unknown location and unknown viability. The options we've got here is that the pregnancy is viable, but early, too early to see on ultrasound. And there's always the possibility, of course, of an ectopic pregnancy. So the management of these women where the HCG is less than 1500 and we cannot see a gestation is to track the HCG. Um, and if we have an increase in 48 hours of the satisfactory level, then continuing to monitor and repeating the ultrasound when the ATG uh, reaches that discriminatory value of 1500. Obviously, if the levels are falling or not going up in the satisfactory management, it raises the prospect of an ectopic pregnancy or a non viable pregnancy. So, a reasonable algorithm putting all of this together if women have vaginal bleeding in the first trimester, the main stage is just to do an ultrasound first. And if an ultrasound sees a baby and the crown lump length is over seven millimeters and the heart rate is seen, then we've got a viable gestation and, uh, and we can provide reassurance. If we can see an intrauterine gestational sac only and there's no fetal pole, if it's greater than 25 millimeters, we would expect to see an intrauterine uh, fetus. And if we cannot see that and we can only see an empty gestational sac, then we've diagnosed a miscarriage. If the gestational sac is less than 25 millimeters and we can see a yolk sac, then we would repeat the ultrasound in about a week and we would expect to see a fetal pole at that stage. If there's no fetal pole in a week, then that's diagnostic of a miscarriage. If the gestational sac is less than 25 millimeters and there's no yolk sac, then we need to give it two weeks, okay? And if in two weeks time, there's been no progress to a yolk sac or a fetal pole, then that's diagnostic of a miscarriage. If the ultrasound's performed and we cannot see a gestation, then that in many ways is when the HCG comes into play. 
And if the HCG is over 1500, we would expect to see a pregnancy somewhere. It's probably an ectopic pregnancy. And as I mentioned before, we'd probably see an ectopic pregnancy at that level. But if we can't and the uterus is empty, then we presume that there's an ectopic pregnancy likely to somewhere. This is, of course, on the, on the proviso that the HCG, um, that the woman is not behaving like she's having a, a, a miscarriage and that the HCG that we've caught at this time is not an HCG which is rapidly coming down. So I guess yeah, keeping in mind the clinical scenario here with whether a woman that uh, appears to be bleeding heavily and with the passage of clots and appears to be going through a miscarriage, then an HCG, a snapshot level of over 1500 with no baby inside the uterus, maybe um, the HCG on the way down. So just throwing that caveat out there, taking the clinical picture into, into account. If the HCG is less than 1500, then we don't know what's going on. Uh, and we, it could be an early viable pregnancy, it could be an ectopic pregnancy, it could be an early miscarriage. And that's when we perform serial HCGs, as I mentioned before, um, to see what the, what the progress is over 48 hours. And then eventually, if things are going well, to perform an ultrasound when we've reached that discriminatory level of 1500 international units per litre. So we'll talk a little bit about miscarriage and, uh, and incidence causes and treatment. So we probably all know that miscarriages are very, very common. Probably at least 10 to 15% of clinically recognized pregnancies will miscarry. And it's probably 20% overall if you include um, you know, early prior to recognition uh, uh, or prior to, uh, prior to realization uh, of pregnancy. Age is the biggest risk factor. and um, and it's as low as 10% amongst 25 to 29 year olds and it's as high as 57% for 45 year olds. Interestingly, 25 to 29 year olds are at the lowest risk. It's a little bit higher for women under the age of 25. Uh, it's about 17% for women under 20. That's about uh, 12, 11 to 12% for women between 20 and 25. It's at the lowest between the 25 to 29 year olds and then it starts to go up after that. A prior miscarriage does increase the risk a little. The odds ratio is about 1.5 for one previous loss. So the risk of another miscarriage after one miscarriage is a little higher. It's one and a half times higher. Um, other particular risk factors are diabetes, obesity, thyroid disease, and chronic stress. Obesity, interestingly, is, is a relatively reasonable uh, risk factor, 1.6 uh, odds ratio, and that's for anything with a BMI over 25. Uh, the, the, the relative risk of a miscarriage for obesity is actually a little bit higher than diabetes, in fact. And if diabetes is very well controlled with good glycemia, then the, uh, the miscarriage risk is back to baseline. Both hyper and hypothyroidism can increase the risk of miscarriage. And there is some evidence that chronic stress uh, increases the risk of miscarriage as well, probably due to uh, cortisol levels. Um, acute stress episodes for women doesn't appear to increase the risk of miscarriage, but women that have chronic stress conditions um, or chronic stress throughout the first trimester are, are probably at a slightly higher risk of miscarriage. Um, So what can we do to reduce the risk or manage uh, you know, a, a threatened miscarriage? Well, there's no real evidence that any vitamin supplementation makes a difference. Um, there's no good evidence that progesterone supplementation makes a difference for miscarriage uh, risk reduction. Uh, progesterone does get splashed around quite a bit. And there have been a couple of observational studies which have shown that progesterone may be a little bit better than placebo uh, for uh, reducing the risk of miscarriage or reducing the risk of miscarriage in the presence of vaginal bleeding. But the evidence and the literature is certainly not very clear and there are plenty of studies which suggest that it doesn't have an effect. Um, aspirin doesn't appear to have any role to play in reducing the risk of a miscarriage for women that are actually bleeding. Um, and there's no real evidence that the use of low-dose aspirin will reduce the risk of a miscarriage if it's just given de novo to women early in pregnancy. There is some evidence that it may reduce the risk of recurrent miscarriage for women that have had recurrent losses, but the evidence is not particularly strong. Probably the best way of reducing uh, miscarriage is by modifying those previously mentioned risk factors. So what actually causes miscarriage? Well, as we probably all know, the majority of endochromosomal problems and genetic problems, about 70% we estimate uh, of miscarriages are due to chromosomal problems. And with, with that being the, the vast majority of causes of miscarriage, then for most of these uh, miscarriages, it, it is obviously a predestined thing, uh, which reinforces the fact that, that treatment with progesterone and treatment with aspirin and, and various vitamins that have added about are not gonna make a difference if, if it's a predestined thing. Um, most of the uh, 
uh, miscarriages between six and 10 weeks will be chromosomal. Interestingly, the really, really early ones probably are less likely to be chromosomal, but most of the ones where we get to the stage that we can identify a gestational sac uh, or fetus, the majority of those are going to be chromosomal. Other less common causes of miscarriage and maternal anomalies, the presence of fibroids, especially submucosal fibroids can increase the risk, the presence of endometrial polyps and the presence of intrauterine adhesions, fairly uncommon causes, but, but, but are causes. Uh, there are infective causes of sexually transmitted infections, especially in young women, the presence of chlamydia and gonorrhea are risk factors for, or etiologies of miscarriage. Um, obviously trauma, significant trauma, and then some women will have spontaneous subchorionic bleeding for reasons we don't fully understand. And if there's a subchorionic hematoma identified on ultrasound, in particular, if it seems to involve a size greater than 25% of the volume of the gestational sac, then that significantly increases the risk of, of miscarriage. Obviously, on top of all these causes are other risk factors such as smoking, drug use, low socioeconomic status, um, and various, uh, various racial backgrounds, uh, Black American women and whatnot. So once we've diagnosed the miscarriage, how do we manage them? Well, uh, as we probably all know, there are three basic uh, or three main stages of management. There's expected management, there's medical management, there's surgical management. The largest uh, study done is a little bit old now, but the MIS study done in 2016 was the largest randomized controlled study looking at, uh, at randomizing women to these uh, three various treatment arms. And, um, and most of our sort of success rates has come from the MIS trial. Um, expected management is associated with a 66% of uh, successful complete miscarriage. Medical management generally about 87% successful management, and we'll talk about what that entails in a moment. Um, surgical management, meaning a uterine cure rate is 95% successful. And by 95% successful, we mean that about 5% of women who have a cure rate in the MIS study at least will have retained products and need to have another cure rate. Um, uh, and hence, you know, be, be a failure of the primary treatment option. The MIS study showed that medic, women having medical management and expected management were more likely to have unplanned hospital admissions and obviously more likely to have unplanned curettes for, uh, for the treatment of their, uh, of their miscarriage. Um, infection risk is the other thing that's often been um, looked into in terms of uh, you know, management of miscarriage. And um, the MIS study showed that there were similar infection rates of about 2 to 3% in all of the treatment arms. Um, since the MIS study, a Cochrane view has suggested that infection risk is actually a little bit higher in the surgical group than, uh, than medical and expected management, but the rates of, uh, of infection overall are fairly low amongst all of the treatment arms in the order of just a couple of percent. Expected management is waiting and seeing if the miscarriage passes by itself. And the best success rates with expected management are with an incomplete miscarriage. So if a woman has a miscarriage in progress with vaginal bleeding and cramping and a miscarriage in progress, then that is the most successful, uh, 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 that's, that's associated with the most success of expected management. And that's associated with between a 76 and 97% success rate uh, with expected management. The next most successful is fetal demise. So, um, you know, a, a visible fetal pole and, and no fetal heart rate. And then interestingly, an embryonic pregnancy seem to be associated with the, the lowest uh, likelihood of success. So the embryonic pregnancy being the gestational sac with no embryo within it. So that seems to be, for some reason, they seem to hang on a bit longer. And those ones are associated with, um, with uh, lowest uh, success rates with expected management. But obviously, the longer the wait, the more likely it is to be successful. And, um, and uh, you know, that's, that's obviously the, uh, the rate limiting step for a lot of women, the, the unpredictability and, and the waiting um, is often what limits women's uh, uh, success with expected management. Um, but you can, uh, one of the largest studies looking at this, once again, is a little bit old now, but a thousand women uh, randomized to expected management uh, up to four weeks. And, um, and 91% uh, were, uh, were managed uh, well with, um, with uh, incomplete miscarriage. 71% had, uh, had uh, successful expected management with fetal demise, and it was down to 66% with the an and embryonic pregnancies waiting up to four weeks. Medical management, misoprostol has been most commonly used, and there are several randomized controlled trials looking to the use of, of uh, misoprostol for the management of miscarriage. The largest study and what we base most of our, our stats on, once again, is a little bit old now. It's a large randomized study performed in 2015 of 652 women. And that study showed a 71% expulsion rate by day three and an 84% expulsion rate by day eight, okay? Many doses of misoprostol have been, uh, have been trialed, but 800 micrograms vaginally 
seems to be uh, the best uh, the best does. Um, misoprostol is is uh, has got several advantages. It's, it's quite low cost. Uh, it's stable at room temperature. It just you know, is a tablet in the box. Um, it has a fairly low incidence of side effects, and it's fairly readily available and fairly cheap. It's off patent, and um, and fairly easy to administer. There's no particular skills required to administer, and it can even be administered and controlled by the patient if if needed. Patient selection for medical management is quite important, though, and women need to be aware that they will obviously miscarry. Um, they need to be aware to expect, you know, significant cramping, significant bleeding, and the passage of significant clots. So women need to be to be prepared for that, uh, both in terms of analgesia and just realistic expectations about what to expect with the bleeding. So patient selection is quite important. And women need to be able to obviously come to the hospital at any stage if they're concerned about the amount of bleeding that they have and, or, or if they're in significant pain. Okay. So And follow-up is also important for these women. So they need to have adequate follow-up. And uh, through the early pregnancy clinic at St George Hospital, we usually arrange for follow-up in three to four days. Um, to see whether they're one of the 71 percent of women that will expel the, the, the fetus within three days and then we usually see them back in a week for a face-to-face -face review and usually a follow-up ultrasound to ensure uh, complete expulsion of the product of conception so the misoprostol is usually a single dose it's a 200 mic uh, microgram tablet and we give four tablets to 800 micrograms misoprostol vaginally is a single dose is the usual uh, most common regime Recently, uh, there's been some thought into adding mifepristone into the regime. So mifepristone is a uh, progesterone receptor antagonist. It's most commonly used for terminations of pregnancy, but it has recent research has suggested it may be a benefit. Historically, we've kind of thought mifepristone probably is not of much value because progesterone levels are fairly low, and then therefore the progesterone receptor antagonist is probably not going to be of much use if it's a non viable pregnancy and progesterone levels are low anyway. But there was a recent randomized controlled trial performed in 2018 which suggested it does improve the expulsion rate. Uh, up from 80, up to 83% with the addition of mifepristone. Uh, their expulsion rate with misoprostol was a little bit lower than the previous studies at 67%, but there was a significant improvement in this study. Um, so we at St. George now have started to include mifepristone into our medical management regime. Mifepristone is given orally about 48 hours before the administration of misoprostol. Um, so we would give mifepristone orally, and then they would return uh, 48 hours later for the insertion of the jar on the suprostal. It can be given to the woman to do it in our patient herself. Uh, so there's the option of giving it in the MS2 pack, which is what uh, my research and whatnot we use for terminations. Um, but at the moment, we're, we're, we're administering it in hospital. Surgical management is the final management. Obviously, the historically uh, traditional way of dealing with a miscarriage is to have a, a suction curette associated with a 95 to 97% complete evacuation rate. So women need to be aware that there is a several percent chance of not completely evacuating the product's conception and needing to have another curette. As I mentioned before from the MIS study, there's about a 2 to 3% infection rate with the uterine curette, very low complication rates, and very low blood transfusion rates. So what do we do at St George Hospital? Through our early pregnancy clinic, we will often uh, we will offer all options, of course. Expected management, of course, being most successful for incomplete or miscarriages in progress. Um, we widely offer medical and surgical management up to 12 weeks for you know, a mis miscarriage. And as I mentioned before, we have now integrated mifepristone into our medical management protocol with mifepristone uh, orally 48 hours before vaginal misoprostol. A little bit of a talk about ectopic pregnancy now. We all know that ectopic pregnancies are ectopic pregnancies anywhere outside the endometrial cavity. They were first reported by an Islamic scholar in uh, Islamic Spain in uh, the 10th century. Um, the first successful uh, surgery to remove an ectopic pregnancy with survival of the woman was performed by Lawson Tate in Birmingham in the UK in 1883. Lawson Tate being one of the founders or fathers of gynecology, along with Marion Sims. Marion Sims being famous for the Sims speculum. I don't think anything was named after Lawson Tate, but he was certainly renowned for several things. I think he might have done the first appendectomy as well, but he was one of his renowned things was, was performing the first successful removal of the tubal ectopic pregnancy with survival of the woman. Obviously, as these advances occurred, you know, blood banking, blood products, and as I mentioned before, the, the uh, arrival of HCG assays and then the arrival of diagnostic ultrasounds in the 1970s has made the diagnosis diagnosis and subsequent treatment of ectopic pregnancy is obviously much better. Incidence has slowly uh, increased 
Um, it certainly increased quite rapidly between 1970 and 1992, presumably from uh, the increase in sexually transmitted infections. Played out a little bit in the 1990s. Um, the increase is probably a combination of a true increase in incidence and also improved diagnosis, you know, finding small ectopics that in days gone by may have been subclinical and not recognised. Overall, ectopic pregnancies are about 2% of all recognised pregnancies, okay? Obviously, the vast majority of them are going to be in the fallopian tube, 96%. At about 4% will be somewhere else, cervical, corneal, ovarian, abdominal, cesarean section scar, and heterotopic, heterotopic meaning a pregnancy both inside the uterus and also unlucky enough to have an ectopic as well. Um, and we'll go through we'll go through these in, uh, individually. Um, the diagnosis is a combination of physical signs, which can be unreliable. Some women will have a palpable uh, adnexal mass, but that's fairly uh, fairly uh, unreliable. And as I mentioned before, serial ultrasound assays and serial ultrasonography with uh, the diagnostic threshold of the 1500 international unit HCG uh, will see most ectopic pregnancies at the present. The HCG, as I mentioned before, 20% will behave like a viable pregnancy and seem to rise. 10% will actually be declining. About 70 to 80% will be slowly rising, but under that 66% rise threshold that we discussed before. So the classic HCG pattern for an ectopic pregnancy is a rise of less than 66% over 48 hours and a less than 15% fall. More than a 15% fall is often associated with a miscarriage, okay? As I mentioned before, low progesterone may rule out a viable pregnancy, but not so helpful to distinguish between a miscarriage and an ectopic pregnancy. Ultrasounds, we will actually diagnose most ectopic pregnancies on an ultrasound. Up to 74% will be diagnosed on the initial ultrasound and up to 98% will be diagnosed eventually on a follow-up ultrasound. So ultrasounds usually do the job for us. Um, and as I mentioned, ultrasounds will often initially show either an intrauterine pregnancy, a pregnancy of unknown location, or an ectopic pregnancy. Uh, for the PULs, about 10% will eventually go on and have an ectopic pregnancy uh, ultimately diagnosed. What do we see on ultrasound? Well, classically, we see the empty uterus. Uh, about 20% of women will have what we call a pseudo sac, which is where we see a tiny little amount of fluid inside the endometrial cavity, uh, which um, to the untrained eye might suggest uh, an intrauterine gestational sac, but it often doesn't have a residual reaction and a few other signs. So this concept of a pseudo sac is a tiny little bit of fluid inside the endometrial cavity, presumably from stimulation of the endometrium from the hormones of the ectopic pregnancy. But 56% of the time we will see some free fluid and we see, sometimes see this ground glass appearance, which is consistent with blood. And then often we will see a tubal ectopic pregnancy. Um, we often see, we will sometimes see a sort of a non-cystic adnexal mass, which moves separate to the fallopian, to, to the ovary. Um, sometimes we'll actually see a proper gestational sac outside the uterus, most commonly in the fallopian tube, with sometimes a little yolk sac and sometimes even a little fetal pile and fetal heart motion if it's alive. A couple of ultrasound pictures. This is uh, just showing the left ovary and the adnexal mass, which on ultrasound will often sort of move separate to the ovary, which is how we kind of tell that it's not attached to the ovary. Um, and if it's adjacent to the ovary, we just see it's usually in the fallopian tube. And that's another little view of an ectopic pregnancy where you can actually see a gestational sac and a tiny little fetal pole within it. So as I mentioned before, if we have to do an HCG over 1500, if there is an ectopic pregnancy, we will often actually get an answer on ultrasound, we'll often actually see an adnexal mass. And the HCG is less than 1500 are the trickier ones where we have to do serial HCG measurements and then eventually a serial ultrasound. It's important to be patient with women with HCGs under 1500, especially if the woman is stable. And it's obviously very important to rule out a viable pregnancy before, before labeling a woman or potentially treating a woman um, as an ectopic pregnancy. How do we manage ectopic pregnancies? It's very reasonable to manage ectopic pregnancies conservatively if the HCG is quite low and the woman is stable. Um, and we will often watch low level HCGs, especially if it's under a thousand, to see how things play out if the woman is asymptomatic. And quite a few ectopic pregnancies or presumed ectopic pregnancies will in fact self-resolve or self-abort. Um, some studies have suggested up to 88% of the HCG is less than a thousand will actually just resolve by themselves with close monitoring of HCG and obviously close monitoring of symptoms. If the uh, ectopic pregnancy is progressing, then the mainstays of, of treatment are either medical management or surgical management, and methotrexate is the, uh, is the mainstay of medical management, either in a single or a multiple dose regime. Methotrexate was first used back in the 80s where there were quite extensive 15, 15 day courses of, of uh, methotrexate and they were initially used for difficult ectopic pregnancies in difficult places. Uh, multiple doses were initially used, but as, time's gone by, as time has gone by, we've finessed it down to a single dose treatment for most women um, and associated with, with very good success rates. Multiple doses have a higher success rate than single doses, but multiple dose regimes are, are fiddly and associated with higher side effects and the difference between 
single dose and multiple dose for most ectopic pregnancies, although there is a slightly higher uh, success rate with multiple dose. The, the clinical difference is not high enough to really justify the, the, the fiddliness of a multiple dose regime for most women with ectopic pregnancies. The suggested criteria for medical management are an HCG below a certain level. Most guidelines would recommend only for HCGs less than 5,000. At St George, we're a little bit more liberal. We will, we will manage medically up to 10,000. And where the, where, where the cutoff is given is just where hospitals and services decide uh, is a reasonable balance between success rate and non-success rate. Um, most of us would only use methotrexate if the ectopic pregnancy is less than 35 millimeters in size. Some cutoffs are 40 millimeters. So if we can actually see the ectopic pregnancy, if it's bigger than 35 to 40 millimeters, that would generally be an exclusion to using methotrexate. Uh, the presence of a fetal heart in the ectopic uh, is it generally an exclusion. Um, obviously, we don't want to have signs of rupture and patients need to be compliant with follow-up and that's really, really important. Okay, So any clinical sign of rupture, generally speaking, excludes um, uh, medical management. The way we follow these women up is with a day four and a day seven HCG level and we'd like to see a 15% decline. As I mentioned before, the success rate uh, is mainly dependent on HCG levels. So medical management is most successful if the HCG is low um, and it goes down as the HCG increases. So most hospitals will use uh, a cutoff of 5,000. You can see there a 91% success rate. At St George, we'll go up to 10,000 because we've decided that an 86% success rate is reasonable to use methotrexate, um, but other, other units will have lower cutoffs. And there's no absolute level. It's just a question of where one draws the line in terms of those success rates as to what level of HCG one is comfortable with for, for medical management. As I mentioned, the single dose regimen is, regimen is a single shot of methotrexate. Uh, it's a 50 milligrams per meter squared body surface area, and that ends up being between 70 and 100 milligrams of IM methotrexate for most women. There is also a multi-dose regimen, which we will use, which is a milligram per kilogram on days one, three, five, and seven, with calcium flinate, um, so flinic acid, um, given as a rescue between uh, on alternate days between those multi-doses. The multi-dose regimen is most commonly used these days for women that have tricky ectopic pregnancies. So if a woman has a, an ectopic pregnancy in an awkward area, such as the cesarean section scar or in the cornea of the uterus, we will often use multi-dose regimes because uh, they're more surgically difficult to manage and, uh, and they're often associated with higher HCG levels. So after medical management, uh, we will do a day four and a day seven HCG, and we like to see a decline of 15% by day seven. Okay, so that's diagnostic of success. Uh, and then we will perform weekly HCGs until the um, HCG is fully declined. Some women get what we call separation pain, um, which is where uh, the, the, uh, the ectopic pregnancy starts to abort or uh, starts to separate, and that can be associated with a degree of pain. About 50% of women will get some sort of hematoma uh, develop on ultrasound. Uh, methotrexate is generally speaking very safe and very, very well tolerated. Some women get some transient GIT bloating, some transient LFT abnormalities, but it's generally very well tolerated. Um, and you know, the washout period of methotrexate is something that's commonly asked. We don't really, really know. And in fact, there haven't really been any convincing anomalies reported in fetuses where women have fallen pregnant promptly after receiving methotrexate. But we would usually recommend somewhere between four and six months as a washout period before women conceive again. I personally say about three months. Some people say six months. No one really knows. Um, but if women do fall pregnant within that washout period, as I mentioned, there hasn't been any significant real increased risk of fetal anomalies, so most women will be fine if they do happen to accidentally fall pregnant within the washout period. As I mentioned, about 90% success, uh, up to 20% of women may need a repeat dose if we don't get that 15% HCG decline by day seven. The mean time to resolution is 35 days, meaning the mean time to HCG resolution, but it can be up to 109 days. So some women will have a, protract a protracted uh, follow-up and a protracted period following the HCGs, and women who embark upon medical management just need to be prepared uh, to have the follow-up. Okay. Surgical management, of course, historically, there's always been a debate about whether we remove the tube or try and save the tube. That debate has pretty much been settled in favour of removing the tube if the contralateral tube looks normal. And the reason why we remove the whole fallopian tube rather than just trying to remove the ectopic and save the tube is that there is a higher incidence of persistent trophoblast. Um, and there may be a slightly higher risk of recurrent ectopics if we try and save the fallopian tube. Okay. Um, and there's a relatively similar fertility if the contralateral tube is normal. Okay, so the view is that if the tube is damaged enough to have an it has an ectopic pregnancy, it's damaged, and it's probably not going to work very well anyway if we try and salvage it. And if we try and salvage the tube, there's a risk of retained trophoblast or persistent trophoblast, which may cause mischief. 
and leaving a damaged tube does increase the risk a little bit of a recurrent ectopic pregnancy. So we would generally remove the entire fallopian tube rather than try and save it these days, okay. I might skip over this slide because we're running out of time a little bit, but just to sort of reinforce the fact that, um, you know, comparative studies between uh, methotrexate and salpingostomies and salpingectomies have sort of suggested that, you know, removing the fallopian tube, of course, is a little bit more successful. Um, Multi-dose methotrexate is, uh, is, is, has similar efficacy to, to surgical management. Unusual ectopic pregnancies, every now and again, we see somewhere an ectopic pregnancy in a slightly odd bod location. Um, interstitial or corneal ectopic pregnancies are relatively dangerous ones. Growing in this interstitial area, the thick muscular corner of the uterus, um, they tend to bleed badly if they burst because they're surrounded by fairly thick and fairly vascular uh, myometrium. So interstitial or corneal ectopic pregnancies are trouble, trouble makers. Um, I've never seen a cervical ectopic, but they have been reported. We are seeing occasional cesarean section scar ectopics. I've never seen an abdominal pregnancy, but we've had a few ovarian pregnancies over the years. They can be difficult to diagnose and are often only diagnosed when we do a laparoscopy, expecting to see a tubal ectopic pregnancy, uh, but the vast majority of them are going to be tubal. So corneal ectopic pregnancies, about 3%, they are tricky. And um, as I mentioned, when they rupture, they rupture bad. Um, and they do rupture a little bit later than tubal ectopic pregnancies. They can be managed medically if they're diagnosed, and but there are lower success rates. So we do sometimes consider multi-dose um, methotrexate regimes rather than a single dose. Surgery can be more tricky for these because we have to resect the corner of the uterus and it can be uh, trickier and, and they're more susceptible to needing a laparotomy. Caesarean section scar ectopics, we're starting to see a little bit more commonly because of rising caesarean section rates. Interestingly, they do not seem to be associated with an increased number of caesarean sections that that individual woman has, um, but they are just generally associated with a general increase in the caesarean section rate amongst the population. Uh, if a woman's had a previous caesarean section and she has an ectopic pregnancy, there's about a 6% chance that ectopic pregnancy will be in the caesarean section scar. They're diagnosed with an empty uterus and sometimes they can be visualized with a small gestational sac implanting over where the caesarean section scar is. They can be tricky to manage. Um, we will often revert to medical management because surgical management, although it is the most reported form of treatment, it, is, it can be tricky because the location uh, resecting them can be difficult and, um, and we will often uh, favor medical management first. Ovarian ectopics, as I mentioned, they're attached to the ovary. They can be difficult to diagnose and they're often diagnosed in surgery. Uh, they're just random phenomena. They're not really associated with uh, tubal damage or PID or assisted reproduction. Um, they have a higher risk of rupture, about a third of them will rupture. Heterotopic ectopics are where there's a viable gestation and there's also an ectopic pregnancy. Um, they're often diagnosed late and are difficult to diagnose and are very, very rare. We can't use methotrexate, of course, and they often require surgical management. They're often picked up when we do a laparoscopy for a woman who's known to be pregnant who has pelvic pain, who are expecting to see an ovarian cyst or some such thing, and we actually feel a ruptured ectopic, and they can be sometimes tricky to diagnose otherwise. Abdominal pregnancy is very, very rare. I'll just skip over that because we're a little bit short on time. A quick word on anti-D during pregnancy, in early pregnancy, 25 international units of so the small dose is recommended for women that have a miscarriage, termination of pregnancy, ectopic pregnancy, or a CVS. We don't normally recommend it for women that just have a threatened miscarriage who go on to have a viable pregnancy. Um, 250 international units will cover 2.5 mils of fetal red blood cells, which is five mils of fetal blood. And that's way over the amount of blood that the fetus has in the first trimester. So it well and truly will cover any isoimmunization. And after 12 weeks, it's the largest standard dose. We are running out of time, but I will whip through some other things. <laughs> pain in early pregnancy, obviously miscarriage ectopic pregnancies, ovarian cysts, fibroids, uh, round ligament pain uh, are common causes of pain in early pregnancy. Um, it's always worth just keeping in mind UTIs. UTIs often present with atypical funny pain in early pregnancy, so always remember checking for a UTI. Um, ultrasound is obviously the mainstay of diagnosis for ovarian cysts, fibroids, ectopic pregnancies and miscarriages. Fibroids can cause red degeneration, which is where the fibroid grows from pregnancy hormones and degenerates internally and causes quite significant pain. Not dangerous for the baby, but can cause quite profound pain for women. Most common in the second rather than the first trimester, uh, trimester but fibroids over five centimetres can degenerate uh, as they grow and stretch and, and bleed internally and can cause quite profound pain. This round ligament pain is often a sharp shooting pain, which more commonly once again occurs in the second trimester rather than the first, but that's fairly benign. Often women will have pain in early pregnancy and we don't have a certain diagnosis. Hyperemesis, um, we all know about hyperemesis. 
Nausea and pregnant nausea and vomiting in pregnancy is very, very common. 72% of women will suffer from it. 42% will be mild, 52%, 55% will be moderate, and 1% will be severe. It's usually between four and 10 weeks of the onset. Um, but about 24% of women are unlucky enough to get it on and off all the way through the pregnancy. Most of the time, women are better by 14 weeks, but and almost all women are better by, by mid-pregnancy. Um, but some women are unlucky enough to have a drag on all the way through pregnancy. You can see from this chart here the incidence, uh, most commonly in the first trimester, and then it does decline as women get into the second trimester. Um, the etiology, well, we don't really know for sure, but it's presumed to be due to HCG levels. You can see from this chart here that there's a correlation between HCG levels and the incidence of nausea and vomiting in pregnancy. Hyperemesis gravidarum is the severe form, 1%. So these are the severe 1%. Um, the definition is nausea and vomiting in pregnancy with significant reduction in oral intake and also weight loss of greater than 5%, plus or minus dehydration and electrolyte imbalance. And they score severely um, on the uh, pregnancy unique quantification of nausea in pregnancy score. And I'll show you that table in a sec. This is quite a nifty little, uh, little scoring chart which can kind of help you grade how bad the hyperemesis is. Um, and, um, and you can score them based on, you know, frequency of, uh, of vomiting, uh, feeling how often they're feeling nauseated or sick during the pregnancy and how many times they've vomited or had dry heaves in the last 24 hours. Women who score 13 or more are considered to be high or severe. So to score 13 or more, you need to be getting some fours and fives on most of those, okay. So over 13 um, is considered to be severe and they're the women that will often need hospital treatment, uh, investigations and potentially electrolyte management. Most women with scores under 12 don't require hospitalization or if they do need to be rehydrated, can be rehydrated in the community. And most women with scores under 12 don't need to have electrolytes assessed or anything like that. Uh, but the severe end of the scale we need, are the ones that we need to be thinking about whether they would benefit from hospital administration, hospital stay and intravenous fluids. Management, you probably all know uh, the stepwise approach to management. Women with mild symptoms may do well with ginger or, or, or vitamin B6. And then we often move to some of the older or uh, antihistamines such as uh, Phenergan and, and rest of it. Obviously, both of these are sedating. Rest of it's quite useful for women to take at night if they're suffering from vomiting and need a bit of a mild sedative at night. Both of these drugs are category A. Uh, Prochlorperazine, which is Stematil, is often something we'll move to next. And then your dopamine antagonists such as uh, such as Maxilon, metoclopramide. Um, ondansetron, of course, is widely used now, and a lot of people reach straight for ondansetron. It's probably the most potent and uh, and best anti-nausea medication we have. There's pretty good safety data now for ondansetron. It's been used fairly widely, and we have pretty good safety data for its use. Um, it's quite constipating, so just be mindful of constipation with ondansetron. And women are obviously susceptible to constipation when they're dehydrated and uh, and unwell in the first trimester. Corticosteroids are sometimes used for the real calcium ones, but they're the women that are in hospital being managed in a hospital basis. Be mindful of managing reflux, which is quite common for women that are, that are, that are dry retching. Um, omeprazole is safe to use in early pregnancy. Renitidine for which withdrawal was quite commonly used. Obviously, just standard antacids, uh, you know, your you minor antacids are rather fine. And as I mentioned before, managing constipation, whether it's drug-induced or just from uh, from dehydration is very important as well. SOMANS, which is the uh, Society of Obstetric Medicine of Australia and New Zealand, has a guideline on hypermesis, which is quite nifty, and it does go through management. And I've got a link to that at the end of the uh, at the end of the presentation. And they've got a quite a nice management chart here, which is a quite a nice one to follow, um, depending on whether they're mild, moderate, or severe. So this is quite a nice one to have a bit of a look at, which has a nice, sensible step. Uh, stepwise way of managing women with hyperemesis and uh, you know a, a good referral pathway for when to decide to refer these women on. A few other things, I'm going to just quickly talk about low-dose aspirin in early pregnancy. It's not necessarily a pregnancy complication, but it's always worthwhile just refreshing everyone's memory about the importance of starting low-dose aspirin in early pregnancy. In particular, for women at risk of preeclampsia, we would recommend low-dose aspirin for anyone with a past history of preeclampsia, any current hypertension, and anyone deemed to be at high risk of preeclampsia, such as renal disease, pre-existing proteinuria, twin pregnancies, and type 1 diabetes. Okay, We've been doing that for a little while now, and hopefully this is not news to most of you. Um, it's 150 milligrams given nightly, which is half of a standard aspirin tablet um, for women at risk. And the earlier one starts it, the better, okay? Uh, in many ways, erring on the side of starting it um, because it is important to start it. And if we, when they come to hospital for their antenatal care, we can always stop it if we think that it might not be needed. The other group of women that we're starting to use it on more now, uh, independent of the women at risk of preeclampsia, is women at risk of fetal growth restriction. So women with two or more of these risk factors, we're starting to use it more widely. Starting it early, Prior to 16 weeks is most important, continuing up to 36 weeks. Or on the side of starting it, we can always cease it if you're not sure, okay?
very low risk of side effects. Some studies have suggested a slight increased risk of early pregnancy bleeding, but not particularly high. We've got a very nice information sheet that we give women which, with all the right logos on it, um, just to reassure women about the safety of aspirin. They often get a hard time from the pharmacist saying, don't take it, don't take it. Uh, but we have to reassure them that it's very safe to take it at low dose in older pregnancy and significant reduction in preeclampsia and emerging data on the risk of uh, reducing a risk of fetal growth restriction later in pregnancy for women that are at risk of that. Very quick word on fever in early pregnancy. Babies don't like a fever in early pregnancy. It's been well shown to be a risk uh, factor for birth defects such as neural tube defects. Influenza uh, in the first trimester has been shown to increase the risk of congenital abnormalities uh, by several times. Uh, we don't know whether it's due to the flu itself or whether it's due to pyrexia from the flu, um, but we like women to avoid flu and febrile illnesses early in pregnancy. So paracetamol, encouraging the flu vaccination, obviously avoiding non-steroidals in pregnancy, but paracetamol is the mainstay for managing pyrexia. Um, a little bit about COVID, um, uh, because it's obviously topical at the moment, obviously, you know, we, we all know about vaccinations and we're all have probably got some experience now with COVID in pregnancy. Uh, interestingly, pregnant women don't seem to be more likely to get COVID, but if they do, they're at an increased risk of severe illness, especially in the third trimester. So making sure women are protected prior to the third trimester is really important. The usual risk factors for COVID apply, such as obesity and other, other uh, you know, health, health concerns, increasing the risk of, uh, of complications. Uh, the UK data is the best for COVID. They've got the best data on the effects of uh, COVID in pregnancy. Uh, they've experienced a very small increased risk of maternal death. Um, their maternal death rate has gone up from 2.2 to 2.4 per 100,000 maternities, so a very small increased risk. Um, but we do know that there's an increased risk of stillbirth. The odds ratio is two. Obviously, stillbirth is rare, uh, but, but it goes up a little bit. Um, increased risk of prematurity by two to three times. A lot of that is going to be iatrogenic, so delivering the baby because the mum's done well with COVID, but there is an increased risk of spontaneous preterm labour from inflammatory, you know, from inflammation and, uh, and a feb having a febrile illness in pregnancy. And there is an increased risk of having having a small baby at the odds ratio is 1.8. The Delta variant seems to be a little bit worse. Um, one, point, uh, one in seven pregnant women with the Delta variant are admitted to hospital compared to 1.10 of the previous Alpha variant. Um, and important to say there's no increased risk of congenital abnormalities or birth defects with COVID. COVID vaccination, we probably all know that it's, it's, it's been nicely shown to be safe at any stage during the pregnancy. A lot of women are very anxious about having it in the first trimester. It is safe in the first trimester. Uh, for, for the anxious women, I'll often say, we're looking at just have it after the first trimester, but it is quite safe. Um, we've got good safety data from the US and the UK. Over 200,000 pregnant women have been given it in the US and the UK with no uh, evidence of any adverse effect. There's definitely no increased risk of miscarriage, congenital abnormalities or stillbirth. And with those large numbers, where you know we've got pretty good data on that. Uh, we all know that the mRNA vaccines, the Pfizer and the Moderna ones, the ones to give in pregnancy. The AstraZeneca is probably okay, and there doesn't seem to be any increased risk in the um, in the vaccine-induced thrombocytopenia and thrombosis uh, for the few women that have received in the UK. But uh, but it's the messenger RNA ones that we're using. And as I mentioned before, when you really need to be protected by the third trimester, that's when they're at most risk of getting complications of COVID. Okay. So that completes the talk. Um, I've got there a couple of links to um, some guidelines there. In particular, the SOMANS guideline is very good uh, with some nice clear referral pathways for hyperemesis and uh, some uh, RCOG and Ranskog uh, links there to some of the COVID information. Okay, so I guess we will hand over if we've got time for questions. Um, Lauren and Janice, do you want to take things over? Yeah, perfect. Thanks for that, Dr. Miller. There are about five questions here. We'll try to get through to them. Um, the first one is with HCG's levels and ultrasounds, um, how does that differ in like a molar pregnancy versus a normal pregnancy? With a molar pregnancy, the HCG levels usually go up really, really rapidly. So with gestational trophoblastic disease, uh, if, it's a, if it's a complete molar pregnancy, the HCG levels usually skyrocket. So the, the suspicion with HCG levels, if you've got a really, really high HCG level up in the 100,000s uh, at eight, eight to nine weeks gestation, then that's suggestive of a molar pregnancy. So molar pregnancies usually skyrocket um, and women often get significant early pregnancy symptoms as well. So a skyrocketing HCG, really, really rapid rise up in the hundred thousands uh, quite quickly is suggestive of a molar pregnancy. But look, the diagnosis is made on ultrasound. So if a woman's got bleeding and she's got really, really high HCG levels, you're going to diagnose it on, a, on an ultrasound. So, you know, if a woman clinically has bleeding and she's got really, really high HCG levels, do an ultrasound, it's going to give you the answer. 
Perfect. And in a woman with a history of recurrent miscarriage, miscarriages, is it worthwhile checking progesterone along with the zero beta HCG in early pregnancy to help guide whether vaginal progesterone should be considered in future pregnancies? Controversial. <laughs> um, progesterone is used quite widely, especially in IVF land. And there's a little bit of evidence to say that for IVF pregnancies, it may improve the implantation. For women that are having, who haven't had an IVF pregnancy and who have had recurrent miscarriages, the jury is out. Um, obviously, most miscarriages are going to be chromosomal, and obviously, progesterone in that setting is not going to be helpful because it's a predestined thing. For women that have recurrent miscarriages, otherwise, look, the jury is out, and there's not a lot of great evidence. The trouble with a declining progesterone or low progesterone is knowing whether it's a chicken or an egg, you know, knowing whether the progesterone that's low is a reflection of the pregnancy not working out, or whether the low progesterone is in some way the cause of the miscarriage, if that kind of makes sense. So it's hard to know, and we don't have any great evidence for the use of progesterone. There have been some studies which have suggested that it may be a little bit better than placebo, but there's not a lot of great evidence and the improvement is slight, if any. Look, progesterone is very, very safe and, um, and commonly used to reduce the risk of preterm birth and other things for women that are at risk of that. So, look, it is widely used and it is safe and it probably doesn't do any harm, but does it do any good? Well, the jury's out, okay, and I don't have a, 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 an answer for that. Um, there's no real good evidence that it's useful, what doesn't cause any harm. Take, take, take from that what you wish, but, um, but certainly not a lot of great evidence in the jury is out, okay? Thank you, Dr. Miller. Um, how far into a pregnancy is medical management appropriate for uh, managing miscarriages? We use medical management all the way through pregnancy for pregnancy loss. Um, we, for the outpatient medical management, we will use it up to 12 weeks. So um, the single vaginal dose of 800 micrograms, we will use that up to 12 weeks gestation. Obviously, the bigger the fetus and the bigger the gestation, women need to be prepared for, you know, more significant bleeding and cramping and discomfort. So patient selection is important over about nine to 10 weeks because the baby is bigger and they need to be aware of the dynamics of what to expect. But we would use it as an outpatient up to 12 weeks gestation. But we also use medical management for fetal demise greater than 12 weeks, but we use it as an inpatient for those women because the fetus is larger and they really need hospital care um, if it's over 12 weeks gestation. And we use multiple doses of, uh, of misoprostol for those women. So outpatient management is acceptable up to, up to 12 weeks. Patient selection, as I mentioned, is important when they're over about 19 weeks because of the size of the pregnancy. But yeah, we would use it right up to 12 weeks gestation for women that are, that are happy to, or you know, women that agree to use it. Perfect. And this one's a favorite of mine. Do you advise women having to wait after their next period before trying to conceive again after a miscarriage or does it not matter? Also, apparently a patient told this person that a woman is more fertile in the few months after a miscarriage. Is this true? <laughs> yeah, there's a couple of uh, urban myths there, isn't there? Look, I think um, I usually say to women who have had a miscarriage either by a cure, managed by either a curette or by medical management or expected management, wait till the bleeding settles and then look, wait until that next menstrual period comes and then start trying after that next menstrual period. Now, the, the, the main reason I say that is just so that women have peace of mind and everything is kind of back in working order in quotation marks. And also just to help data pregnancy accurately, it's kind of nice to have that reference for menstrual period. The reality is not many women will actually fall pregnant um, before that first period comes because there's usually a little bit of inflammation. The endometrium is often not quite there yet until they go on and have that first ovulation and menstruation. So not a lot of women will actually conceive in that first month before the first period so I usually say wait uh, for one period to come but I wouldn't recommend waiting any more than that you know a lot of people think that they have to wait three or six months but there's certainly no evidence that they need to wait any longer than um, than that first menstrual period but look my practice is to suggest waiting until that first period comes um, just to be sure everything's settled after the miscarriage and to just be able to sort of date a pregnancy a bit more accurately. They're, they're the main reasons, you know. If a woman does fall pregnant before the first period, then there's no real evidence that that's a problem. But as I mentioned, sometimes the endometrium just takes a little bit of time to recover and it's actually a little bit unlikely to fall pregnant in those first few weeks after a miscarriage anyway, okay. I, um, if a woman has a later pregnancy loss in the second trimester, we'd often recommend waiting a few months, no one really knows exactly what, but we're usually a mid trimester, so between 12 and you know 24 weeks, if a woman has a 15 or an 18 week fetal loss, I'd often suggest waiting three or so months because there's some evidence to say that the cervix and the 
you know, the, the dynamics of the user has taken a little bit of time to just reach their baseline. Okay, but certainly for first trimester losses, waiting until the first menstrual period is usually what I'd recommend. All right, three more, Dr. Miller. Um, so yep. in hyperemesis, the LFTs, uh, sometimes they become raised. Um, yep. What is the duration of these raised LFTs after the vomiting has improved? Um, look, I don't think I know the answer to that. Um, I guess, uh, who knows? I mean, I guess um, the abnormal LFTs are presumably related to, you know, to dehydration and just general unwellness. I mean, I don't really have an answer to that. And I guess you would just have to expect that as the woman clinically improves and rehydrates herself and whatnot, then the, um, then the LFTs will, will, will eventually get better. I mean, if the LFTs are rapidly going up, I mean, I think, you know, we need to be thinking about other things in that setting. Um, it's not uncommon for LFTs to be mildly deranged, but if they're rapidly deteriorating, then that's usually not consistent with just hyperemesis and we need to be thinking about something else going on. But look, you know, in terms of how long they take, I really don't know. I mean, the normalization of LFTs for other sort of, you know, unwell conditions, I guess, often does lag the clinical improvement with the woman. So look, I don't know, but, you know, maybe a few weeks, I don't know. All right, um, two more. Uh, this is regards to aspirin. Uh, for women with risk factors like age, previous miscarriages, should we start aspirin preconception at first diagnosis of pregnancy or wait till 16 week gestation? I think this is regards to preeclampsia. If a woman is at risk of preeclampsia, um, then I, I would start the aspirin pretty much as early as you can really. Um, you know, not necessarily the day she has a positive test, but by the time she kind of sees you guys and sort of is six weeks or whatever, the, the most important time for aspirin is at the time of placental development. And that's usually sort of between the six and 12 week mark. So there's not really any evidence that we need to start aspirin before that, um, but starting it or, or having aspirin on board around the time of placental implantation development is most important. So the earlier the better, but certainly it'd be nice to get it started by six to eight weeks and placentation occurs around the sort of 10 to 12 week mark. So that's where the money really is with the aspirin. Um, we would recommend starting at any time under 16 weeks because there is some benefit, but if a woman's got the 16 weeks and she hasn't started it, there's probably not much benefit starting it after 16 weeks, okay? Um, so prior to 16 weeks, but the earlier the better. No real evidence you need to start it before she conceives for reduction in the risk of preeclampsia. For recurrent miscarriages, you know, it, it's hard to know. Um, there will be specific women that we would recommend aspirin, women that have antiphospholipid antibodies and whatnot, we would sometimes recommend women take aspirin uh, preconception. But in the absence of that, there's no real evidence that women need to be on aspirin preconceptually if they've got a history of recurrent miscarriages. Most women will be okay to just start aspirin when they conceive. And for those women, they can probably stop aspirin around the 12 week mark. There's probably no benefit in taking aspirin any longer than 12 weeks if you're just taking it for recurrent miscarriages. But the women at risk of preeclampsia, you should really take it all the way through pregnancy. We usually stop it in the last month of the pregnancy around 36 weeks. Perfect. And last one, Dr. Miller. Uh, for rhesus negative patients with a complete miscarriage, what is the best way to access NTD injections? Yeah, we can give anti-D through the early pregnancy clinic. So referring them into the early pregnancy clinic is uh, is appropriate. So send them in. The, the early pregnancy clinic is open uh, at 8 a.m. weekday mornings at St. George Hospital. No appointment required. Women can just turn up um, and we'd be more than happy to give them anti-D. Obviously, we'd like them to turn up with um, a bit of a summary of, as to what's gone on and, and a copy of their blood results so that we know that they're recent negative. But we're very happy to give anti-D uh, in the early pregnancy clinic as required. And you've got a couple of days grace in giving it. So if a woman miscarriages on a Friday, she can usually wait till Monday. The reality is, however, that you know, the likelihood of a woman after immunizing in the first trimester is actually quite low, you know. And although we recommend giving anti-D, if, if it ends up being, uh, I shouldn't really say this, I guess, but if we end up forgetting about it or not giving it, the likelihood of an after immunization at six to eight weeks is actually very, very low indeed. Because red cell antigens for the fetus don't really kick in until you know, midway through the first trimester. And the likelihood of after immunization is actually quite low in the first trimester but we give it and uh, you've got a couple of days grace refer them into the early pregnancy clinic if they're in the emergency department for whatever reason then they've got it there in the fridge and it will be administered there no problems okay perfect thank you dr miller